Uh, very shortly, I'll introduce a little bit where I'm coming from, and, and uh, this is a bit fragmented. I just put it some points um, from these two days, kind of what are in my head and what I'm thinking after, after having this. So this is who I am. This is where I work. So this is the Aalto University. Um, Aalto is compiled of six schools. And now I would like to, <laughs> to reference same then. Kristin Berkhaust yesterday said, oh, this looks like a dream to come through this uh, university. You have the sciences and you have the arts and everything. Kristin said, I'm trying to change it to become that. And I think Aalto also kind of needs that. And, and sorry about being a bit cynic. So this is the art school and here's the department. I'm from the Department of Art and Media. And the, um, we have, so maybe the design is the most known from the, from the school. And uh, then we have general art studies and the gray one. That was very interesting, university-wide art studies. And now I want to reference yesterday's Claudia's talk, where she said that uh, often uh, people are, oh, this is so great and fantastic. And at the same time, there comes cuts. So that's cut out. And that was art studies for anybody else than the arts. So, so, and it was very, very popular and very interesting. And what I heard students talking about it from engineering, from chemistry and so on, was that it really kicked and changed their pers perspective. So that's, that's the cynical. Um, so Claudia also said that oftentimes we do these kind of things which are crossovers um, in this kind of small project and the same then this hybrid lab network has been. So it's kind of side activity in a way, even if it links to education, it links to your interest in, in research. And here's another one. I have a kind of different but a similar funding body. It's an artificial biology, robotics, and art, which also has science and art. Again, it's kind of si on the si happening on the side. Um, that's still going on for one more year when this is ending. So... I thought we've been talking a lot about the science and science and art. And this is a Bruno Latour in 1998 was writing this, that science is certainty. Research is uncertainty. Science is supposed to be cold, straight, and detached. Research is warm, involving, and risky. Science puts an end to vagaries of human disputes. Research creates controversies. Science produces object objectivity by escaping as much as possible from the shackles of ideology, passion, and emotions. Research feeds on all those to render objects of inquiry familiar. So um, what I, why I wanted to bring this in is that terminology is also very uh, important. And, and maybe instead of we have always art and science kind of this juxtaposition Maybe we could think about the kind of a research. What is research? And, and maybe to actually uh, kind of get rid of the disciplinary divisions. So I have here one of the questions. Why do we have disciplinary divisions? Do we need them? Or could we imagine another kind of a structure? And that's something to think. Um, here I just wanted to give a reference also there's a quite interesting, this knowledge, knowledge production modes. There's been kind of mode one, mode two, and mode three. And I think we are working on a mode two. So the mode one is kind of, let's say, basic research and tries to kind of bring out universal truths. Um, mode two is multidisciplinary teams are brought together for short periods of time to work on specific problems in the real world for knowledge production, often applied research. Not necessarily, I think, but but kind of. And I see the hybrid labs uh, from, from this perspective. Mode 3 is also interesting. It is knowledge emphasizes coexistence and co-development of diverse knowledge and innovation modes at the individual, structural, organizational, and systemic level. So kind of from uh, smaller to larger things. And I just put it, rethinking science. Um, this is Helga Novotny, Peter Scott, and Michael Gibbons book as a, as a, this is where the mode two is written out. Um, 
then I think the panel will talk about education a bit, at least, I hope. The, the idea was that um, there's experiences, what you share, courses you have. And uh, one of the simple questions I also wanted to pose also for the audience, how do you define a discipline? How do you make a new discipline? How does it born if we want to bring two fields together? How would that form a, a new kind of thing which would then have a trajectory? Or is it then kind of passé already? That when it's, a, when it's a kind of defined and established as a discipline, it starts following the same path than anybody else's, any other discipline. So also this, I think, what is the criteria uh, for a discipline in science? So if I say, okay, we have a new discipline, it's called a chair. Where would you put it? What's the criteria for putting it in the science or in the arts? And these are some of the thoughts uh, from the yesterday, especially. There were some comments I thought were interesting about this depth in the knowledge, uh, in-depth experts versus in-with experts. And I am, I'm somehow thinking that we should foster both. Um, some might want to go like this, and others want to be experts in, in bridging. Um, then I put it imbalances, <laughs> how to get rid of them. We had yesterday in some talk a lot of imbalances coming in and out. And then um, this was in the sort of a coffee break discussion that someone said, it seems things are currently moving in many places and institutions for these ideas of going across the disciplines. My question is how to avoid the collapse that nothing, that we get tired and nothing really happens. And that's sort of my introduction. And now I would give a hint to the audience. We have a super powerful panel here. And um, they're all kind of power people. So could you please uh, make questions also about power structures, about funding, about these issues where these people might have something to say? So let's get on. And could we have Alexandre first? And, uh, and there is a Portuguese parliament, Comité on Education and Science. Then we take the second speaker, of course, female now, Fatima Vieira, who's a vice rector for culture of the University of Porto. And then we have a Enrique Quintino, and I apologize, my pronunciation might be completely wrong, who is in Erasmus Plus National Agency here in Portugal and a higher education team, and somehow doing something with sports too. We had a short chat. So, yeah, so, do you have presentations or are you just talking? Okay, so then I just leave this here so you can look look um, who they are. Well, first of all, let me start by thanking the invitation to be here with you today. Um, and. Um, I have 10 minutes. About. About 10 minutes, okay. I will tell you. So it's going to be, it's going to be somewhat telegraphic. Maybe we have questions afterwards, which would help. Um, I'd like to start by saying, actually responding to the provocation that was made um, just a few minutes ago, that uh, I think the current challenges that we are facing um, in the world today um, have a level of complexity um, that demands transdisciplinary approaches, that demands people from different areas of knowledge to get together and to try to, um, to understand the challenges and then to try to understand, to, to develop uh, strategies for dealing with those challenges. And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can pick almost any one of them. If you talk about climate change, um, the effects it has on health, the effects it has on agriculture, the effects it has on um, st stability of populations in different places, immigration. All these things are the result of um, the continuous use of fossil fuel. And yet we're talking a lot about um, replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy 
And um, the question of storage is a very complicated one because batteries, we don't really know what to do with batteries afterwards. Um, the question of whether we should go back to some nuclear where it's useful or not, these are all the types of questions that come up. I started, uh, I was born in Africa, in Mozambique. Um, I spent the first 25 years of my life uh, in Southern Africa. I did all my uh, undergraduate uh, and graduate studies at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and all my uh, high school and so on in, in Lorenz Marx, which is now called Maputo. Then I spent the next 20 odd years of my life in Berkeley um, as a professor and, and head of a, a large institute of uh, environmental studies. And then the last, and then the next 25 years in Porto as a professor uh, in the school faculty of medicine, and then um, now as a member of parliament uh, and head of the committee on education and science. That's the introduction, very brief. Now, I was a very bad student until I reached the age of 14. I barely passed. And what changed uh, was uh, a, um, a teacher that arrived, a new teacher, who took us on a trip to an island just opposite the city where I live called Inyaka. And we were shown uh, two extraordinary ecosystems, mangroves on one hand and coral reefs. And it was the beauty of these, I think, more than anything else that made me start to study, to, to work, <laughs> um, and to become a better student. When I um, entered university in, in Johannesburg, um, oh, while I was in high school, the subject that I discovered that really enthralled me was called descriptive geometry, which is some way of representing bodies um, in three dimensions, thinking of how you cut them, shadows they make, and so on. So when I entered university, I liked mathematics, I liked physics, uh, I thought since um, I like also descriptive geometry, maybe I should do civil engineering. So my first year was in civil engineering. When I entered the second year, I walked into the, into the room and there were about 120 students in civil engineering, not one single woman. And all of these were uh, South Africans who um, liked rugby, which I detest, uh, and drank lots of beer, which I also don't like. And so I was obviously in the wrong place, and I changed into theoretical physics, which had only 15 students. Uh, half of them were women. Um, each one was from a different country. It was an ideal place to be in. And um, in the third year of my degree, I decided to take a whole year out of physics and mathematics to do philosophy, German literature, and French literature. Why? Because the professors of those disciplines were well known to be exciting, motivating professors. It was probably the most intelligent thing I did in my whole degree was to take a full year of these subjects. And I even wrote a little paper about waiting for Godot of Beckett. Everybody knows about it. And my original idea was that Godot was not God, but he was actually Mephistopheles because the play is all about people being bored all the time. And Mephistopheles is the, is the individual that makes people excited. That's what Faust is all about. And so I got very excited about that. And I did another, I became involved in another project, which is to become a client, uh, you know, a sort of imaginative client, to the students in the architecture fa faculty uh, for them to, to design a house for me. And so we had lots of discussions, many days. They provided the plans, and then they gave me the solutions. And it was a very exciting um, experience for me. I was very young, um, and uh, it left a very powerful uh, impression on me. In Berkeley, um, most of the projects that I chose to do in research were transdisciplinary. They didn't involve art, but they involved biology, sociology, 
uh, physics, mathematics, biochemistry, and so on. I was always working at the interface of something. That's what interested me. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I gave a course, I started a course, which was probably the most interesting course I ever taught, which was about uh, physiology for non-scientists. It was a course that had 1,200 students in about three huge lecture halls. And the idea was to talk to French majors, architects, uh, lawyers, whatever you want, about how the body works. It was divided into three parts, general physiology, the brain, and sex. Maybe that's why there were 1,200 students. <laughs> But it was a very exciting course, and I can tell you the most interesting questions that anybody has ever asked me, including many Gordon conferences that I went to, were by these students, and we can talk a little bit about that. In Porto, um, I tried very hard to see if we could get um, students to um, be forced to spend time in different faculties. It's not easy. Uh, we started a course in bioengineering, uh, maybe 12 years ago, in which the students in the first semester would spend time in the engineering school, the second semester would be in the medical school, and so on for two years before they then chose whichever degrees they wanted to develop. Um, it was an exciting, uh, I think it's still working, maybe not exactly the way it was started, but I think it's still working, and I think it's very important for students to be in different environments. It's extreme, it's not just to take a course somewhere, to be in a different school, to be in a different way of thinking about the world and so on. Uh, and I still believe that it's not optional courses because optional courses don't work. Students usually choose the ones that give the highest grades and the simpler ones. And we need a way of them getting involved in another way of thinking and, and, and actually thinking about the world. About jewelry, I, I'll end with the jewelry because I was very, very, um, uh, I was very curious and imaginative about this, the, the idea of beauty that is hidden. Does it exist if it's hidden? I'm not sure that's the message, but for me, I spend years and years and years asking people who make jewelry to make me a ring, and nobody's ever done it, uh, which would be either gold or silver, doesn't matter, or platinum, I don't care. My favorite stone is emerald, and where the emeralds would be on the inside of the ring so that nobody can see. So the emeralds touch my skin, but nobody knows that there are emeralds in my ring. And everybody has told me this is not possible because emeralds are very fragile. And when you make a ring, you have to heat it, and you have to do things like that, and you cannot do uh, a ring with emeralds on the inside so that nobody could see the emeralds. That was my idea of a jewel for me. Ah! <laughs> okay, so something to learn from that. Thank you, that's all I wanted to say. Please, please hold on your uh, questions. We take them at the end. And Fatima, please. Yes, thank you. I've got the three, three images. To show what, first of all, thanks, very, thanks for inviting me. It's, I'm really pleased for being here and for contributing to this, I would say, um, important and very much needed discussion. And uh, I'd like to contribute to the discussion by making three points today. And the first has to do with this image. Could we have the, the, the previous one, please? Because this is the second. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is, this is a hypercubic uh, showcase of sudden comprehension. This is a, quite a, a, a difficult title. So I repeat, hypercubic showcase of sudden comprehension. It was created by George Wagensberg. It was created for the Hall of Biodiversity, which belongs to the, natural, to the Museum of Natural History and Science of the University of Porto, which is a uh, science and arts museum. And as you can see, there are several uh, eggs. 
And the first thing that you really take from, from looking at it is what I would call, I would say, aesthetic pleasure. So you get this aesthetic pleasure. But then if you pay, if you look closer, if you pay, atten pay attention, then you realize that um, the aesthetic pleasure also derives from the way the eggs are organized. And we can look at them here. And in fact, they are organized according to three dimensions. And the first is color. So you cannot see it very well here, but the, the, the eggs uh, over there on the bottom, at the bottom, they are dark. Let me see if I, you can see it here. Can you see? So they are darker. So there's organization from dark to light. And then uh, according also to size, from big to small. And then uh, also uh, according to shape. So we have uh, from a spherical um, shape, as if they were balls, to uh, an oval shape. And so this hypercubic showcase of sudden co-creation really has a, a trademark. So uh, George Wagensberg really registered it uh, as a trademark. And he explained that his idea was that once you arrange eggs in this way, there's a fourth dimension that uh, uh, immediately strikes you. That is, when you position one egg in relation to its neighbors, then you think of the relationship or the relationships that are behind it, they, they create a new unit of meaning. And in fact, if you look at the, the showcase, the first thing that you understand is that there are no um, dark, um, big eggs. So there's, there's something which is missing over there. So there are no dark, uh, big uh, eggs. And the other thing is that um, there are no uh, big eggs with a, uh, an, uh, with a spheric uh, shape. So um, this is the, the first thing that, so when you look at it, you take static pleasure, and then you suddenly realize this, there are no big, dark, and spherical eggs. And then you start you know, asking questions. Of course, what I was told is that scientists do not know why there are no uh, big, dark eggs, but they suspect that there are no big eggs uh, with spherical uh, shape nowadays because they would fall easily from the nest. So this is something that you look, you take aesthetic pleasure, but you also, uh, it also provokes, uh, I would say, intellectual enjoyment. And this intellectual enjoyment derives uh, from your sudden comprehension of a scientific problem. And this, I would say, is the, uh, what the innovative language of scientific museology is all about. And of course, there are many other examples of how art has contributed to the public uh, image of science. And in fact, before STEAM, we used to live in a world where science and society were totally separated. And so I would say that the showcase is a very good example of the STEAM movement in the sense that now we have art mediating science. And so science and society are now strongly interpenetrated. And of course, there are many, as I said, many other examples of this interpenetration which result from transdisciplinary sci art, as it is called now. Um, so STEAM, I would say, is all about integrated knowledge perspectives. Uh, STEAM is about true cross-pollination between different disciplines. Now, the second point I'd like to make is about the definition of STEAM. And I'm sure that um, the, 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 the problem of the definition has already, has already been discussed before. But uh, I, I do believe that it's important to say, first of all, that STEAM is not a methodology. It is a movement. It is a, mov a movement that aims to downbreak strict disciplinary boundaries. Of course, it, is, um, it has recurrent uh, associated methodologies. That means with STEAM, we normally find you know, design thinking, problem solving, inquiry-based methodologies. But then I would say that they, they, these could exist within uh, a single dis discipline. So STEAM is not a methodology, it is a movement. Now, there's a, a problem, I would say, with the, the understanding of STEAM, at least in Portugal. I don't know uh, if the same happens in other non-Anglophone countries. The problem, there's a problem of translation, with translation. Because when we move from STEM to STEAM, in the spirit of those who added this A in English, 
uh, A stands from, for the arts, in the sense of the liberal arts. And so what happens is that here in Portugal, we understand it as the arts, and when we talk about STEAM, we only think of the visual arts, design, and so on. But in fact, in the spirit, it was not of, of those who created the concept. It was visual arts, it included performative arts, it included, of course, the humanities, it included social sciences. So what is left? Nothing. Okay, so STEAM, in the spirit of those who created the concept, um, actually had to do with everything. So it had to do with a holistic perspective. Of course, we know that, you know, nowadays, uh, the, the boundaries between disciplines that we have nowadays, they all result from what happened in the 19th century. But uh, there have been many, many people claiming for um, this, this holistic understanding uh, of knowledge. I, just give uh, the example of Edgar Morin. Edgar Morin, the, the French um, and uh, the philosopher and, and sociologist, has been claiming for years that we need a holistic perspective, that we need complex thinking. And uh, complex thinking can only, we can only have complex thinking when we have different perspectives and different knowledges. So the, I would say that the, the beauty about STEAM has to do with the fact that we have the contribution from different perspectives and knowledges, uh, which are mandatory so that we can have this complex thinking, because complex thinking is about understanding that one thing can be one thing and its opposite at the same time. So STEAM is, I would say, another work, another word, sorry, for holistic thinking. So it has to do with thinking. And this is the, the third point that I'd like to make. Because thinking really is what, what interests me. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, at university, of course, we, we have to provide students with specialized education. We can also provide them with arts education. But in fact, I would say that our main aim should be to train their minds. So thinking is all about training minds. And so we need to, to prepare students to... Uh, deal problems, uh, to deal with the problems they come, um, that they are uh, presented with. And I'd like to show you my second image, uh, which is about something which happened here in 2018, um, ecological minds. And so we, we came here, and so the, this, this was a conference with, which was hosted by Anna Olsen and also Julie Verlitzenc. And we are all already asking this question. So thinking and building the social and ecological transition, can we teach utopia? But in fact, this discussion about utopia was, in fact, um, can we teach ecological minds? How can we train ecological minds? And in fact, for this particular conference, what we were discussing uh, was uh, the different ways we could fight you know, environmental problems. But I would say that the, the, this phrasing, ecological minds, it still stands um, as regards you know, other issues. So I, I do like this phrasing. I, I, I believe that it far surpasses, surpasses environment, environmental, uh, environmental problems. Sorry. And uh, I would say that it has to do with uh, building relationships between the different knowledges and competencies that you acquire during your training and, uh, in fact, during all your life. And also the relationships with the other uh, elements of the uh, ecological system to which you belong. And uh, Annalisa Amaral, uh, which, is a, which was a very dear friend and a poet, uh, she was also a professor at the University of Porto, and unfortunately, she has, um, she's, she's, she has died, very recently died. She once said that thinking is all about constructing a house for our knowledges. So thinking is about constructing a house for our knowledges. And this is what we have been trying to do at the rectorate, at, at the cultural department I'm now coordinating. So we started with this question, how can we train students? How can we help them construct their own big house for the several knowledges and competencies they uh, acquire. And that's why we created five new curricular units. So they are called transversal and transferable competencies 
curricular units, unidades curriculares de competências transversais e transferíveis. And so we signed a protocol with San Juan National Theatre, another one with Suárez Reis National Museum, Casa da Música and Botanical Garden. And we also had a, a, an additional um, curricular unit about obs on observation and drawing for doctors. What happened is that for a whole semester, we had groups of 25 students they would go to the National Theatre, they would attend rehearsals, they would be taught how to read the text, they, they would learn, you know, at least the basics about the, the theatre. Uh, the same with uh, those that went to the National Museum, the same with those that went to Casa de Musica, they had history, uh, history of music lessons. Those who went to Botanical Garden did what I really need to do, and this is a, a research unit I really wanted to create, because normally, so I'm from the humanities, and normally we say in the humanities, well, people from science, they don't read, they don't know nothing. The fact is that we from the humanities know nothing about science. So this is also about giving um, scientific, uh, the basics, the basics of science. And here, I would just like to, uh, to, to show you a very, very small, small video. I'm afraid it's in Portuguese, but you will sense this is what happened. So before you, you show it, uh, so this, this is a video that shows the result of uh, that visit of our students to the, uh, that's in the semester that our students spent at Suárez dos Reis. So they went there, as I said, they learned the basics, uh, you know, about the, uh, the museum, and they curated an exhibition. So if you now go to the museum Suárez dos Reis, at the ground level, there's a wonderful exhibition which has been created by the students. And these students, they came from the 14 faculties. So we had 28 students, two from uh, each of the 14 faculties. So this only takes uh, two minutes. I, I hope that there's time to see it. Thank you. I was in this unit of curricular because I found this partnership between the University of Porto and the museum. Nós normalmente não temos este tipo de acessibilidade a este tipo de instituições em Portugal, e então foi uma oportunidade de experienciar não só as áreas de interesse, mas também perceber um bocadinho de tudo que se passa cá dentro. Resultou em querer estagiar aqui no museu e acabei por me candidatar e acabei por ser colocada e em setembro vou iniciar um mestrado aqui também no museu. As ciências da educação estão muito ligadas com a cultura. E, por curiosidade, nesse último semestre eu tinha estudado muito a questão dos museus e como é que os museus podem uh, trabalhar com as escolas e com as crianças e como é que isso pode criar uma relação que seja positiva tanto para o museu como para as crianças. Para mim, quase que abraçou todas as competências que eu venho desenvolvido ao longo dos meus estudos, seja na historiografia, seja na educação. Aqui foi possível... Uh, compreender vários detalhes, várias dimensões, vários níveis, várias camadas do museu. Todo o acervo, todos os corredores secretos, digamos assim, que ninguém conhece e sentir-me sentir parte desta casa. Nós passamos por todas as vertentes do museu, desde o momento em que tivemos a discutir o bolor nas peças até ao resultado final. Estamos naturalmente muito felizes porque a Universidade do Porto é a primeira universidade portuguesa a conseguir isto, a conseguir a acreditação de um conjunto de unidades curriculares do campo da cultura, com três créditos de SETS e que valem tanto com as unidades curriculares científicas. Isto significa que a Universidade reconhece que a formação cultural dos seus estudantes é tão importante como a formação científica. Estou naturalmente também particularmente feliz pelo, pelo facto de este caminho ser de mãos dadas com o museu. A universidade aprende também fora, é isso que acontece com os nossos estudantes, foram fora adquirir novos conhecimentos e o museu foi também ativado por esta curiosidade dos estudantes que resultou nesta belíssima exposição. O Museu Nacional de Sós Reis teve o maior interesse em receber esta unidade de preparo alternativa que a Universidade do Porto propôs para, se, para decorrer neste, no, no nosso espaço. Esta unidade curricular veio nos trazer muitas respostas também, novas abordagens, novas abordagens à coleção, novas abordagens ao nosso trabalho, que contactaram com todas as unidades técnicas do museu, mas também pela, pela curadoria que a própria exposição encerra, que traz também uma nova experiência. Estamos completamente disponíveis para repetir esta experiência no próximo ano letivo.
So my name is Enrique Quintino. I came from the Portuguese Erasmus National Agency. And so for it seems it's quite difficult to be here with such a wonderful panel of people who have so such a good experience of dealing with this uh, education teams uh, and have so wonderful reflections about the, the, the team we are dealing with. Anyway, our approach as, uh, as um, managers and project manager of the national agency is to come to these events and we are not just like checking if the foundings are being well applied and see if everybody's getting the signing uh, and if the room is full and complete. Well, we are here to get to know what you are doing because we are in Erasmus and in the European Commission fin financing uh, education. Let's usually we say that Erasmus Plus is like a, a life changing experience. Education is also, of course, a life-changing experience. And what these passion people are doing here, showing us all this project, are making changes in, in life of people. So we do relate to what you are doing. So in Erasmus, we do have financing for all over the world. Of course, we have these 27 uh, um, countries, member states and more the third countries associated to the program like Norway, Ireland, Iceland, North Macedonia, Turkey, Serbia. Unfortunately, we have, uh, haven't got any more UK in it. And third countries uh, not associated to the, to, the, to the program, that is the rest of the world. So Erasmus spreads its uh, way all over the world. We connect to, to everybody all over the world. And normally I have to tell you a little bit of what is Erasmus, probably all of you know. It's an instrument to support education, training, uh, use and sport in, in Europe. It provides learning, mobility opportunities for pupils, uh, young people, students and teachers and staff. Uh, it, it has, a, in this program, a strong focus on, on inclusion of people with fewer opportunities uh, and enhances also the transnational cooperation opportunities uh, within universities, education, um, education and training institution. For this period, Erasmus has a budget of around 20,000 million euros that goes for education, for mobilities, for developing projects around the world. In a, in, in a, in a sense of uh, the individual, so Erasmus gives a, an opportunity to people from all ages. Probably when we, we think about Erasmus, we think in higher education, people, students and staff. But Erasmus works from people from uh, six years till Adults, 80 years or something, something more, uh, universities, uh, senior universities. So it's a, a, a wide range expert uh, of, of people working in Erasmus. In, in what concerns to organizations, a wide range of organizations, including universities, education and training providers, uh, research organizations and private businesses. Uh, the aims are, I just put it here, just to know that we are like contributing to the main strategy of Europe 2020 and uh, specific issue, issues are tackled by the program, including all this one that are related here. I would go on further to, to speak a little bit more of, of uh, the, this particular uh, team. And I think uh, particularly now to Fatima, because I, I, I've learned a little bit more about STEAM. Uh, I was making some investigation about the STEAM, trying to relate what is STEAM had experience, what STEAM experience I had in my life, and that changed the way I, I, I made my presentation. 
So in Erasmus, we, ha we have this defined this uh, transversal uh, priorities, inclusion and diversity, digital transformation, environment and fight against climate change, participation in democratic life. So anyway, this program brings also some no novelties um, that I, I will not just talk about that. Uh, but I'll leave it here so that I'll leave my presentation to to everybody. And in uh, Erasmus, we work with a um, key action. So we have some calls so that uh, institutions can can apply. Uh, the the ones you see it in blue and, and red are the ones that uh, the national agents uh, deal with it. And uh, you apply directly to the national agents. The other ones are applied to the... Uh, European Commission. So when we come to this kind of uh, events, we try to see what is being done within the team. So we have this um, platform where you can search a little bit of what is going on uh, in the in the matter in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, case of STEAM. So you have this platform and you can look by keywords and try to see what is being done. So I will show you some examples that um, there's lots of things going on and have been going on and being supported by Erasmus funds. This is an, a, an example that's, uh, that's, uh, that's already finished in, in 2019. Uh, it has a good practice uh, identification and it, it has also a European Innovative Teaching Award, like how to raise an inventor technology and engineer learning material for school. That's another one. And here, I will show it because it's a way that you can uh, find what people are doing and probably find a way to get some partners. Uh, for example, if you can, or you have here all the information about the project, uh, the, the founding amount, but you also have the, 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 the contact of the institution, the, the country where they are, uh, the name of the responsible, you can really relate to them if you want to prepare um, another um, uh, for the coming year uh, application for a project. So this is a, a, a good field to start looking for partners and to see what people are doing throughout uh, all Europe. Another one. And, well, I found this project where we are here also, Hybrid Lab Network. It doesn't come like a... a, a a team, a steam, uh, a steam word in the search because these guys didn't put steam. They put science, technology, engineering, and humanity. So it's quite important if you want to get to uh, be tangled in this kind of platform. Choose the the, the keywords correctly so that it will be easier to to, to find it. But anyway, they, they are here that are doing such a wonderful job. And uh, there's another uh, outcomes of what we've been supporting in, in, the, in the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, for example, this is a site. Um, this is also a, a really um, an, another example. And I want to show you something. Um, our government has uh, used the Recovery and Resilience in Program Fund to launch uh, last year um, a huge program uh, to impose STEAM education. They call it Youth Impose STEAM and also Adult Impose. So, in a way, we have 33 projects approved uh, in all territory of Portugal. Uh, there are things moving, and they are moving in a way that uh, in 2026 we will have some results. And we are talking about really lots of money put it in, into this 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 matter. We saw we see also see that. There's a, a big amount of money going to uh, buildings and equipment, but also a third of it is going 
to reinforce teaching and non-teaching bodies and also to the incentives directed to at students. This is not a, a, a thing that Erasmo is really involved, but it's nice to see that something is happening in Portugal related to this team uh, question. So it's a matter of what you see. Uh, and the artistic way of seeing the DNA of the projects, uh, of the reinforcement. I will just, Laura, let me just go a little bit further. At uh, uh, this uh, uh, Barcelona last, last uh, uh, May, they were talking about reinventing higher education for a sustainable future. So this is a, a, a World Higher Education Conference that was held just this year. And from this World Conference, uh, it comes some results. It comes like a roadmap for the next 10 years. So, uh, and the special demand that barriers to change be blown down the way. So, being be, be blown down now. So, something has to be the, the, done now. No? From these conclusions, I was picking up the six guideline principles, and probably all of them. I, I like this one because it comes like a connection to what we are talking about in this, uh, in this conference. Inquiry, critical thinking, and creativity, unlocking the potential of every kind of uh, scientific science literacy. So it's quite uh, a thing that everybody's talking about. If you're talking about STEAM, we're talking about critical thinking and problem problem solving, but we always been talking about this. I think since I was uh, went to the university, everybody was saying, you have to think in a creative way, you have to solve problems, and you have to communicate, you have to be collaborative, and to be creative and uh, innovative. So it seems to me like this is not like a, a new thing that is happening. It suddenly, if I remember, I, I come from the sport uh, ground. So in sport, we are uh, uh, related with all these kind of things, resolving problems, training, uh, getting imaginative. If you think in a, on a sport that I was being like a, a gymnastics, so a gymnastics is like an artistic way of sports. No? So as in the arts, we also have the audience. Yeah. So uh, this... Suddenly, it doesn't seem so uh, innovation for me. It probably, I think, it's not innovation, but probably you're not giving the, the, the right intention or the effort that this kind of matters should, should have. And then, taking in account what Fatima said, um, we call it STEAM. And I brought this image that comes from a project because it, it's come the, the letters in squares. And I would like to make a challenge to you because uh, we have the square of science, we have the square of uh, technology, and therefore, so people in STEAM should be a part in the square. I will get you uncomfortable, and I will ask you to rise up when I see when I say the square where you are. Yeah. So if people in green are related to science in this audience, can please rise up for me? Science, 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 please. Yeah, 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 stand up. Yeah, yeah, send your hand, yeah. Science, thank you, thank you, science. That's left to science, yeah. And then we go to the technology. Who's the one here in technology? One, two, three, four, five, six technology. Thank you. Engineering, 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 engineering. Some people don't know that they are in lots of squares, yeah? And arts, arts, uh, yeah, arts, arts, yeah, yeah. And mathematics, mathematics, <laughs> mathematics. And does anybody felt that didn't fit in any of these squares? I don't know what, why are you doing here in this, uh, in this auditorium. If you don't fit in these squares, you're not doing STEAM. 
is that the truth? But that makes us think, what is team? Is that working specifically in these squares or having this kind of concept, not a methodology like Fatima said, that incorporates a transdisciplinary approach of things? So let us think a little bit more. Yesterday, some, someone was saying, oh, these guys were making a project, but they are missing the art, the, creati the creativity. Yes. As I come from a, 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 a management formation, so as a project manager, we deal with lots of uh, specialized people from different areas, and we try to mix them to go to some objective. So shouldn't there be like specialists on this kind of STEAM concept, methodology, or whatever you want to call it? Yeah? This is a question I, I've made. Relating to art, I give you this piece of art. I'm almost finished, and I will tell you this for almost three more or five minutes. Uh, this is a jewelry, of course, yeah? It's a piece of art, it's a nature, yeah? And some of the projects I found, we're talking about a, a, a spider web. And they say that a spider web is a spider steam solution for a real world problem. So in order for a small spider to catch a prey in this construct, an artistic and scientific masterpiece. So it involves technology and science in the kind of strings how they are used. Mathematics, it reflects in the symmetry and shapes involved. And art and injury uh, in the way each particular web is adapted to its surrounding. It's quite poetical, isn't it? So with words, with a humanistic uh, way of saying, we can tell a story about everything and put the concepts wherever we want. We have to do it something, yeah? Just a little, a, a, a little bit of the, the past to go to the future. So in 10 years uh, ago, people were saying, the OCD was suggesting that those countries where students do best at sol problem solving are not only good at teaching the core subjects, but are good at providing learning opportunities that prepare students well for complex real life problems. So what are we doing at the moment? Yeah? And there's also this uh, American approach of the, the things. It's quite nice. They put these things in borders and, and put the, the, um, the numbers. And uh, at this uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, we can see that uh, STEAM or STEM uh, people at the moment are earning much more, yeah? The results the, they, they have and the, the, the way they think that it's going to evolve the, the jobs is going to be much more involved. So, just a joke, STEAM. Are we in a STEAM train? Yeah, slowly. Which train do we want to go? Common places to speak. The paradigm has changed. Everybody's saying this for the 20 or 30 years. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, we have to prepare the next generation to succeed in life, regardless of the profession they choose to follow. Of course, everybody's saying this. Yeah, what are we doing? Uh, have we been teaching students how to think critically and solve the problems, skills uh, that can be used throughout life? And I even say, I is a student, a graduated student, a STEAM result. Or could it be a STEAM result? Professors have been forgotten. Everybody is saying this. Even in the last Congress in Barcelona, this was, this was a statement. Professors have, have been uh, forgotten. A devaluation of the professor, professor role in society. Let us prefer teachers to embrace new, not traditional methodologies. And some of them are really doing it. And that's good. Uh, governmental education policy need to change. Some things are changing, but we have to get, take part of this change. Uh, what has been the role of higher education institution in this process? 
partners show us a, a, a specific role. So it seems that we have a challenge ahead. We still have a challenge ahead. And this challenge uh, has to, to, to be seen like, what are we really missing of the equation? We have to look further and uh, a little bit uh, near the problem. And so knowledge about our real realities and our potentials. Do we know what is happening? We have to have this knowledge. Uh, uh, the, the resources that facilitate our approach and possibilities to implement new method methodologies. Do you have it? How can get, we get finance? Leadership in leading and coordinating projects. This is quite important. And train staff to prepare projects that are addressed to different realities in our institutions. Almost finally, some topics for the discussion. I will leave it. Laura, you looking at me. So what can we do? I think that the image says it all. Uh, looking for pattern is important. Please don't look at a pattern like that because it's going to start working on the on the right side of, uh, of the of the of the tree. So um, just quite finishing, I want to just address that there, this uh, new congress coming up um, just uh, in October. Leave you this information and be disrupted. No way, 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 no way. Do more and do it better. And I'll finish here. Yeah? So, the main thing is like, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. That's the, the main thing I wanted for you, from you. Thank you.